Hi, I'm Lynn Ulbricht, and my son, Ross Ulbricht, uh, is the defendant in the Silk Road case. And one year ago today, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole for um, creating Silk Road and for his role in it. These are all nonviolent charges, and um, it wasn't that he directly did anything on the site, but that he uh, was the admin and the creator. Um, Silk Road is a, was an open market, free marketplace, operated anonymously on tour using cryptocurrency Bitcoin. And, um, uh, and so, and it, it sold, it allowed people to choose what they wanted to buy and sell, with res but there were restrictions uh, for what Silk Road felt harmed people. This included child pornography, no child pornography, no stolen goods, no assassinations and violence. Um, did allow drugs, and the philosophy of Silk Road was that drugs are a personal choice, and if people want to do that, they can. That was their philosophy. Um, so, Ross, as I said, he's, he's in prison now. Uh, he was sentenced to a double life sentence without parole for all nonviolent charges. And what if they have to convict him of this? Did they have, did they catch him with drugs? No, there was absolutely no physical evidence that Ross was Dread Pirate Roberts, the admin or DPR. There were no witnesses. One of the charges was a continuing criminal enterprise that he was some kind of drug kingpin because people on the site were buying and selling things that were illegal. There were no witnesses to say that Ross was this person at all. The only live witness the government brought was someone who said that Ross had told him that he had sold the site. Of course, there was no DNA, and there was no, there were no people who came forward and said, I'm a victim of Ross Ulbricht, he's harmed me or harmed my property. None of it. What they presented as evidence, essentially, was digital. It was chats and screenshots. Um, any crypto computer expert, any computer person can tell you that all you need to do that is a computer and maybe Photoshop um, to create this evidence. And this is a question that's coming up in the courts quite a bit now in different cases, including this one, whether digital evidence is not, is reliable. So this um, charge, this sentence, it's a harsher sentence than most murderers, rapists, kidnappers, child pornographers get. It's a harsher sentence than a real drug kingpin, Pablo Escobar, got. He got 60 years, and he is said to be responsible for 3,000 homicides and 300 assassinations. So, this is being appealed by um, Ross and his attorneys. The um, appeal is an epic document. It is two and a half times the length of the average appeal. It's 170 pages long, full of violations during trial, sentencing, and investigation. And the lawyers told me, well, we could have put in more, but we, we just didn't have room for all of them. Um, and this, this appeal is important because it not only defends Ross's due process rights, but by doing so, defends all of our due process rights. I would suggest that a country that does not have fair trials is not a free country, and that every trial that is accepted, that's unfair, brings us one step closer to tyranny. Now, obviously I can't um, go over the whole appeal with you, but I wanna just point out some of the um, major points in it, so you'll get a general idea. It is available on our website, freeross.org, if you wanna um, read 170 pages. One of the main points in it is that the suppression of evidence, evidence that was favorable to the defendant, Ross, it involved these two men, their um, former federal agents, um, who were at the core of the investigation in Maryland. In addition, they are crypto security experts, and they had basically the keys to the kingdom. They have, they have, they could do anything on the site they wanted to, and uh, they have pled guilty to stealing over a million dollars. They are now in prison. Um, so. What keys do they have? Well, they could access all high-level administrative platforms, passwords, 
change pins, commandeer accounts, including DPRs, and act as that person, act as DPR, and other aliases. They could manipulate and create logs, chats, on both the forum and marketplace, private messages, they had keys, posts, access to account information, and bank accounts. In addition, Carl Force, one of these agents, played an integral role in one of the most damning allegations, unproven and uncharged at trial, that Ross planned murder. Um, he was the one that was at the center of this allegation. He's now in prison. And um, it, the murder never occurred, and all they had was a chat that Carl Force said was between him and DPR. I asked a crypto security expert, so do we know for sure that two, one person didn't just write this whole thing? He goes, no, you don't know. You don't know who wrote this. This is a quote from the transcript of the trial. The prosecutor is saying, the defendant has not been charged, and no murders occurred. And yet, the court allowed them to talk to the jury about it for hours. Ross was also denied bail based on these char uncharged crimes um, that they alleged, and then to, when they actually um, charged him, they weren't there. The, the defense was deprived of a witness list until two days before trial. Usually you get weeks to get things ready to uh, cross-examine, because, oh, well, he these charges, these uncharged charges, and then um, besides the trial, the judge relied very heavily on these uncharged crimes and sentencing. Now, I have a question that um, if Carl Force could create chats on Silk Road, how could we rely on any of this? How do we know he didn't write these chats, as I said? And then again, if Ross is guilty, and it's such a, a it's pretty serious allegation, why didn't they charge him with it at trial? Didn't charge him. So this was argued, these, the, this suppression of evidence was argued pre-trial by the defense and the prosecutors with the judge. And the prosecutor said, look, we, we can't talk about the, this, um, these agents because, well, we're still investigating them and it'll, it'll hurt our investigation if it becomes public. And the defense said, okay, well, wait, go ahead and do your investigation and then we'll tell everything to the jury. No, 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 we're not going to do that. And the court allowed the, the evidence to be suppressed. So, we still don't know the extent of the corruption. Uh, oh, and, oh, and then we found out it wouldn't have uh, jeopardized anything because the uh, agents knew they were being investigated. This came out after trial. They had been interviewed by law enforcement several months prior. And so, it wouldn't have changed anything in the investigation. They knew they were being investigated. So that was a bogus reason. You could call it a lie, I guess. Um, and still, the extent of the corruption is not known. We don't even know if the government knows all of it. There's numerous emails that are still encrypted from these agents that they don't have the key, they weren't, it wasn't part of their plea deal to give over the key, and so it remains encrypted. There's more evidence that the defense doesn't have, and our lawyer says he believes this, this corruption is just the tip of the iceberg, that there's a whole lot more that the government is not revealing or doesn't know themselves. Um, and of course, we will never know if the jury had been told that there were corrupt agents with free access to the site, which, you know, and the evidence that they were being told proved Ross's guilt, um, and they were stealing over a million dollars, if that would have cast reasonable doubt that Ross was the one and only DPR responsible for Silk Road, I know that the prosecution feared that it would. That's why I believe they fought tooth and nail to have this evidence suppressed. Now this is in direct opposition to a very well-established law called the Brady Rule. And it says, if a, a prosecutor cannot suppress, cannot hide information favorable to a defendant, exculpatory evidence, it's against the law. And this is not unique to Ross's case. Uh, Judge Alice Kaczynski of the Ninth Circuit has written extensively and spoken extensively about how this is an epidemic in the United States that prosecutors are breaking the Brady rule and hiding evidence that helps defendants all the time. Now, these agents were the most public example, but they weren't the only example of suppressed evidence. This is Andrew Jones, who um, operated as a high-level admin on Silk Road named Inigo.
they, you know, everybody went under pseudonyms. No one knew anyone else's real name. And he was uh, chatting with DPR, and because they knew very well that different people used these handles, they set up a prompt so that they could confirm the next time they spoke, they knew they were to who they were talking to. And the Negos said in evidence, it's in evidence, that the next time he did that, DPR didn't know the prompt. Now obviously this implies that there was more than one DPR, that Ross wasn't the only DPR. And um, uh, the prosecution successfully managed to block this from the jury's um, knowing this. It was in evidence, and they, the judge allowed them to not tell the jury. Because of course it doesn't fit that narrative of this evil, ruthless kingpin, the one that was controlling everybody, and it wasn't actually, who knows? and how many. And of course it was common knowledge on Silk Road, and it's brought up in the Deep Web documentary that everybody knew it was more than one DVR. And someone said, yeah, it's like um, you're thinking Jeff Bezos is running Amazon, sitting in a cafe in a hoodie, doing it from his laptop. You know, it's just, it's just ridiculous. But that's what the um, prosecution convinced the jury of. Um, even that simple fact about an ego was not allowed to be known. Now, another thing was uh, cro cross-examination was severely curtailed in this trial. Um, the most dramatic, dramatic uh, example involves this agent, Jared Yagen, who was undercover on Silk Road for two years, um, thousands of hours. He was really helping run the site. He was um, under the alias Cirrus. And he had, um, he said in trial, under oath, I heard him, say he believed there was multiple DVRs. But he was honing in on one major one, Mark Carpellis, who was a, um, and he had a substantial case against him. He's a computer systems developer who operated multiple websites. He said he twice documented in sworn affidavits that he had probable cause to suspect Mark Carpellis was DVR, and he sought a warrant for his Gmail account. However, his investigation was sabotaged by the same corrupt agency where those agents came from, Baltimore, Maryland. They um, undermined his investigation by tipping off Carpellis by seizing $2.9 million from his account. Following that, this agent testified that there was a meeting between Carpellis' lawyers and um, DHS Baltimore, and, they, and it went like this. We'll give you a name, we'll give you DPR's name if you back off our client. We don't know what else exchange, was exchanged there, we do know that two weeks later, out of the blue, Ross was arrested. Gary had never even come across his name. Carpellis was not pursued. That got dropped. Recently, he, he has been arrested in Japan for embezzlement on a totally separate thing. So at this point, it, this is all coming out in cross-examination by our um, attorney. And at this point, the um, Prosecution leaps up and they're, he's like, objection, objection. This has to stop now. It has to stop right now. This, this questioning cannot continue. And of course, everybody's like on the edge of their seat, like, why? And the judge, too, she's, she's like, well, this is valid. Well, why can't we do this? And he argued and argued. And instead of bringing the lawyers up to a sidebar, away from the jury's hearing and working it out, which is typically what you normally would do, she sent the jury home an hour early so that they could work, you know, discuss this. She said she was doing this in the interest of justice. Um, now, at that point, our lawyer cited that same Brady rule. This is evidence favorable to Ross that is coming out in cross-examination. This is the Brady rule. You can't stop us. The judge actually agreed. She said, yeah, that's Brady. And she said, went on to say, if an agent pursued someone other than the defendant, not only is it highly relevant, but it's directly relevant. And how he arrived at that conclusion, obviously relevant. That the agent believed there was probable cause, clearly relevant. That the agent believed somebody else might be DPR, is obviously highly relevant. And an alternate suspect strikes me as in the heartland of the defense. And the fact that Carpellis could be a DPR had come out in spades. This is all from the transcript, direct quotes. When the, when the prosecutor continued to argue, she said, look, the Carpellis thing, that cat's out of the bag, court adjourned, and we all went home for a long weekend. When I came back, 
When we all came back, the following Tuesday, I felt like I was Alice in the Looking Glass walking through to a new reality. The court had done a complete 180. Suddenly, all that relevant stuff, that was irrelevant now. The jury was told to forget they ever heard it. And um, there were new rules set up. Um, so, for example, um, do you, the question, do you suspect Mark Carpellis? That was now off limits. The defense could not ask that question. Do you believe Mark Carpellis was DPR? That's off limits. Do you suspect that Mark Carpellis operated Silk Road? Off limits. And that offer to provide the name? That's not relevant. So, here's day three, here's day four. What a different difference a weekend makes. The reason, one of the reasons the court gave for this uh, switcheroo, oh, this alternative uh, perpetrator theory, that just might confuse the jury. We don't want to do that. And of course, Rachel's like, my defense has been eviscerated. And he even asked for some time to regroup, and that was denied. And Forbes wrote, defense completely derailed by the court. So the government was arguing that its own witness, Jared Dreyagin, their own agent, is unreliable, even in sworn affidavits. And the defense can't use the sworn testimony of a federal agent from the government's own evidence. There, it's their evidence. They came up with it. And yet, they um, later took the testimony of a heroin addict who was testifying in exchange for a plea deal. And I heard him perjure himself. Basically, the defense proved he was lying at least twice, and I think it was three times in court. That was okay, but a, a federal agent, no, that's, that's not reliable. <clears throat> so basically, cat's back in the bag and stayed that way the rest of the trial. So another thing that's brought up in the appeal that was uh, wrong was the blocked technical and forensic witnesses. The federal government brought a string of federal agents to uh, the court to testify about the laptop seizure and search. And a lot of their testimony and their protocols questionable. One of them, Christopher Beeson, even testified that he didn't follow guidelines in searching the laptop. At some point it crashed, there were other things. A crypto security expert told me that he is positive that things were planted on that laptop because why else would they break protocols so many times? And he told me, he said anything could be planted. He said digital forensics appears physical, but it isn't. It's much more vulnerable. You can make up data on a disk, a 10-year-old could do it. Again, the appeal points out the government did not produce a single witness to testify firsthand that Ulbricht authored any of the communications attributed to DPR. It was all digital, created, and transmitted on an anonymous, untraceable internet network. Obviously, this sets somewhat of a bad precedent. A bank, a mortgage company will not accept a bank statement, a screenshot. They insist on seeing the original bank statement because they know how easily faked it is. And yet a man can be put away for double life based on the same kind of flimsy, vulnerable type of evidence. And I don't have to tell you guys, this puts us all in peril. All you need is a computer and Photoshop to come up with this evidence. Um, when the um, defense attempted to challenge the um, government agents, and cross-examine them. It was either uh, curtailed or completely shut down. At one point in the jury's presence, the judge said, look, don't ask them any more stuff. You bring your own witness. At that point, our defense lawyer said, mistrial because it is not the burden of proof. It's not on the defendant. It's on the government. And the, the, it wasn't the defendant's job to prove anything. But in any case, we still brought uh, a witness, Stephen Bellavin computer networking security expert from Columbia University. He was ready to um, explain many technical issues to the jury, who by the way, 10 of them were over 40. They were not a highly technical group uh, that understood this stuff. At least it certainly appeared that way to me. I, I don't understand a lot of it myself. But he could have explained to them uh, things like the lack of security of open courts, 
which is what Ross was on when they arrested him, the, how timestamps can be changed. The, the government relied on timestamps in their testimony. Um, those can be changed, and why complex technology of hidden websites makes it almost impossible to prove anything. He could have explained this to the jury. He wasn't allowed to testify. One of the reasons that Judge Gage said, well, this case doesn't require special technical knowledge. I was like, really? So he was blocked. They also brought, the government also brought a Bitcoin witness, um, Agent Young, his name is. He um, had done one other Bitcoin case before. He came from a private company that was paid $55,000 for his last minute testimony. And he wasn't even the guy who came up with all the uh, data that he presented. That guy didn't even show up for questioning. And um, a lot of Bitcoin people were like, this isn't how Bitcoin works. Here's Roger Beer tweeting, the prosecutors in the Silk Road trial have no clue how Bitcoin works or are intentionally lying about it. So of course we wanted to challenge this and explain to the jury about how it actually works. And we called in our own witness, Andreas Antonopoulos, he's written books on Bitcoin. Here he's in Canada um, testifying about it. He was coming without a charge. He was gonna do it with no charge to us. And he was told, last minute, don't get on that plane, you're not gonna be allowed to testify. He could have explained those flaws and explained Bitcoin, but the judge said, well no, the jury understands Bitcoin just fine. This is irrelevant and unnecessary. So, in the appeal it says, by precluding the defense experts who would have countered the complex testimony presented by the government, Ulbricht was denied his Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights to present a defense. Our Constitution protects our right to defend ourselves. Another amendment that is very under attack. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have my little Fourth Amendment thing. I don't know where it is. Oh, here it is. Um, is the Fourth Amendment, which is a very important, obviously important document. It, it's our the one that perfect, perfect, uh, protects our privacy. It's foundational to our privacy and keeps governments from coming into our house and rummaging from attic to basement to see what they can find, going on a fishing expedition. And as you can see here, it talks about particularly describing. Well, it, it requires particularity. They can't, it is unconstitutional to use a general warrant, which is the kind of warrant they used with Ross's laptop, Facebook, and Gmail accounts. It is required that they say, if it were, say exactly what they're looking for, if it were um, a physical file cabinet, there'd be no question, it's unconstitutional. And basically what they're saying is, well, you know, there's nothing about laptops in this Fourth Amendment. Founding fathers didn't mention that. I mean, they're actually literally saying that we give up our, our right to privacy because we keep data on our laptops instead of in physical papers in a file cabinet. And of course, as we all know, laptops are a file cabinet on steroids that, and a gateway to all kinds of private uh, information. So this is a huge and important question for the digital age. Do we still have Fourth Amendment protections or not? And it, this isn't the only case that this is being argued in. The government says no, you don't. Then there is the sentence, the shocking sentence. It, it really it sent shockwaves around the world. And I see it as an extreme abuse of government power to give a sentence like this to um, a first time offender, no violence at all. I'm flimsy proof, in my opinion. And proportionality is a very important foundational principle in our law. It means the punishment should fit the crime and be in proportion. And um, this sentence in the appeal was, was argued against, and it, this was supported by Drug Policy Alliance, a former, former federal judge, Nancy Gertner, um, Leap, who spoke here yesterday, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, and Just Leadership USA, and they're all point out the Eighth Amendment. Cruel and unusual punishment shall not be inflicted. Life sentence is pretty cruel, and a life sentence for nonviolent offenses is very unusual. Supreme Court rulings have also held that criminal sentences that are barbarous 
outrageous, inhumane, or that shock the social conscience are unconstitutional. It says, and the appeal says, the life sentence given to Mr. Ulbricht violates the Eighth Amendment for those reasons, because it's just life without parole for nonviolent drug offenses are inconsistent with contemporary standards of decency. But the judge relied heavily, I mean, she ruled very heavily in favor of the drug war and, and setting an example. She also relied in the sentencing on those uncharged crimes, murder for hire, that were never charged at trial or proven. She mentioned them extensively in the sentencing to justify it, and also on unproven allegations that were not at trial either of six uh, alleged overdose deaths from Silk Road, or deaths from Silk Road um, drugs. And she basically said, well, they're, they're in some way related to Silk Road, so they're valid. And the prosecution, I feel, manipulated some grieving parents, brought them to the sentencing, and um, very emotional, horrible. I mean, I was very upset that this happened. And, um, the, but we also brought a pathology report that was based on the autopsies, based on facts. I paid $9,000 for it, and basically, and this person had 30 years experience doing these reports, and he said, the accusations are incomplete, unreliable, and inaccurate. She just brushed that off. Now, the question to me is, if Ross as a website host is responsible for what's bought on the site, why not Craigslist, Amazon, eBay? Until 2013, Amazon sold cyanide, and a young teenage girl tragically bought some and killed herself with it. Her mother is suing Amazon and the vendor. <coughs> and unlike Silk Road, Amazon's very accessible. In Silk Road, you had to open a uh, a Bitcoin account, you have to know how to use Tor. You know, as we all know, Amazon's pretty easy. And of course, I feel horrible for this mother. And uh, I feel horrible for the parents that were at the sentencing. But I don't see how emotionalism is appropriate for a court hearing. I mean, there, that's a slippery slope to a lynching. And frankly, I feel like this is a lynching. It's also interesting to note that the government controlled the Silk Road site for months before they closed it. And two of those deaths occurred after they controlled it. They could have shut it down. I don't know why they didn't, but are they responsible? They don't mention that. So Congress passed a law in the, in the 1980s saying a judge should impose a sentence that is sufficient but not greater than necessary. And yet the court never gave any reason or basis for why a life sentence was necessary in Ross's case. She just did it. The other thing that the uh, Sentencing Reform Act says is that, uh, because it's designed to make sentencing fair, is that it's, it's important for sentences to avoid disparities. In other words, if one person is sentenced for a crime, the next person should be sentenced accordingly, you know, if they're similar. And yet, and that's why they created the, the, the law, to avoid these huge disparities. And yet, the appeal calls the, the, um, this sentence a grotesque disparity, and I'll show you why. Jan Sloan was convicted as being the biggest drug dealer in Silk Road. We're talking a lot of drugs were sold. They never said Ross actually sold drugs. He got 10 years. Biggest cocaine and heroin seller on Silk Road. Five years. A senior admin at the height of Silk Road's volume, Peter Nash, 17 months. 17 months. He's out, of course. Ross, creator and admin of Silk Road, double life plus 40 years without parole. Now the judge said, and by the way, those agents, seven years and six years. So, why the disparity? The judge said in the, in the sentencing, you're no better than a common drug dealer to Ross. And Cody Wilson said, well, why don't you charge him as one then? But they made it clear why. Ross was politically dangerous to them, and they had to make him an example. Um, they said, we're making you an example because you had developed a blueprint, this is a quote, for a new way to use the internet. Can't be tolerated. 
And the judge at sentencing said, if you break the law this way, there will be very serious consequences. We're going to send that message. She also referenced DPR's libertarian philosophies and writings, I mean, and the site's political libertarian philosophy. And a statement in there that um, DPR said um, that the U.S. government was the enemy. And she said she found this deeply troubling and very dangerous. I bet I could find lots of people at this conference who would agree with that statement that the government's the enemy. There are some people right here. Right. Well, you better watch out because the government can use it against you to put you in prison. <laughs> and her job is to protect the First Amendment. Her job is to protect the sanctity of political speech. And she used it against him. But at trial, his libertarian views were not allowed to be mentioned. The jury was not to know that Ross publicly, by, by his own name, had written in the libertarian and peaceful philosophy. Didn't fit the narrative. And you know, at first people say, is he a political prisoner? I'm like, well, that's kind of hyperbolic. I don't, you know. Now, after seeing this, I'm like, well, it wasn't about drugs. And after hearing the judge at, at the sentencing, well, I think he is a political prisoner. I think it's about a 26-year-old idealistic libertarian who came up with an idea of an open anonymous marketplace and that used cryptocurrency and this threatened the government's control and they could not allow it. They had to put his head on a spike, like in the Middle Ages, put it up there. You do this, do what he did, this is where you're going to end up. Meanwhile, there's these sites have flourished since, so there was no deterrent. And look, I'm not defending Silk Road and a lot that was on there, or drug use, or anything. I'm just saying that this is a political case. And I feel like all the drug stuff and all the sensationalism is a way to undermine support and um, to cloud the issues and the precedents that are being set with this case, a lot of them. So, um, I was honored to be brought to Eastern Europe last fall to speak in Prague to freedom groups in Prague and Poland. It was really great. And uh, part of the trip, I went to Auschwitz. This is me in Auschwitz. What a grim, impactful experience that was to see, be physically surrounded by what a government had done to human beings. And I overheard a, a tour guide saying, wrapping up his story, he said, the uh, lesson here is watch your politicians because this wasn't that long ago. It can happen. And I believe that we're at a crossroads in history. We've left the 20th century. We're careening into the 21st century. Things are changing at a rapid pace. And we're, the courts are very fluid right now. A lot of this, like the laptop seat, Fourth Amendment issues and other issues, digital evidence, lots of issues, are being determined right now in the courts that will impact all of us going forward. Um, and so the question we all have to ask is, do we want to work to have the trend go towards privacy and innovation and personal liberty or towards government intrusion and control? Because that's really what's at stake here. A lot of people ask me who Ross is, what's he like, and I'll tell you he's one of you. He would fit in very well here. This is his signature, um, the first Students for Liberty commemorative t-shirts hanging in Washington, D.C. office. He was nominated for Alumnus of the Year this year at their international conference. Here he is with Ron Paul, State, uh, Pennsylvania State University, where he was a grad student. He's down in the lower, uh, I guess looking at it, lower left. And Ron Paul's in the middle. He's kneeling down there in the lower left. He's, a, he's, he's one of you. And, um, whoops, sorry. He needs your help. This is, Ross is now in prison. He needs your help. We're fighting this. As the appeal demonstrates, our constitutional protections are in jeopardy. So it's not just about him. It's not me saying, please help my son. Of course I am, but it's, you don't know him, you don't know me. But it's, uh, our constitutional protections are at stake, too, with this, this appeal. And um, the government is too big and too rich for one family to fight alone. It just is. And we've gotten a lot of help, but the costs are astronomical. For example, a private company just 
sent us recently a bill for over $13,000, and their job is to take the appeal and put bind it into book form for the judges to read. It's over $13,000. But if you don't do it right, courts have been known to throw out the whole case because you didn't format it right or whatever. So you gotta pay it, you got to pay it. So if you care about free trials and you care about protecting constitutional rights, I just ask please go to freerolls.org. Do what you can, there's lots of options. We now have a tax deductible option there's a 501c3 that um, their job, their, their goal is to defend American prisoners, their, uh, support their defense, and including Ross's appeal. Um, there's, if you listen to audiobooks, you can get a um, free audiobook on Audible of your choice for different levels of donations, 25 bucks being released. It's about the same price you pay Audible. Um, I have t-shirts, I have some up with me here. We have a table downstairs. Um, there's a woman hiking the Appalachian Trail, and if you sponsor her, if she makes it, hopefully she will, um, then you, you know, donate that money to that same 501c3 so it's tax deductible. And all of these links are on the website. And there's lots of ideas on the Take Action page. It's not only about money, it's about support. I mean, I'm just me, and I'm, you know, I don't, I mean, I'm just learning this stuff by the seat of my pants, really. And so any ideas or help or connections or contacts are always welcome. You can always contact me on the contact page here. And um, just help us bring attention to these big issues involved, because they're really important. Thanks. But they used the uh, testimony of, I tell you, that heroin addict to say, well, no, we have a right to do it in the Southern District of New York, which is the toughest district and the most biggest warrior in the drug war. Because um, uh, this particular heroin addict said, oh, yeah, I bought and sold drugs on Silk Road, and I was in New York at the time. So, they, so now he's in New York. I mean, pretty okay. clumsy, in my opinion. So was it, was it under, um, uh I still don't understand, was it under statutes or um, common law, or what was it under, do you know? Well, it's federal drug laws. Okay, so, um, I mean, were they- It's a drug war, it's, a, it's like the battle of the drug war. Yeah. It also is a prisoner of war, that's how I see it. Okay, so it wasn't necessarily, they didn't quote things from the Constitution, they quoted Oh, statutes. no, they don't have, quote the Constitution. Yeah, I know. <laughs> What's that? Like NAS. They even said, just to interject, in their papers, they go, our laws are expansive and adaptable, even when it comes to the internet. We don't have to follow the Fifth Amendment that says it has to be specific and restricted. No, it's expansive, it's adaptable, it's what we want to make it. They said this. Okay, uh, <laughs> did anybody bring it up about their oath of office to the Constitution, the judge or the lawyers or anything? I don't know what that is. Okay, if anybody who gets a paycheck from the government must have the oath of office. Oh, the oath, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that right. Yeah. No, but it's something that I think might be worth looking into. You bet it is. That's, they that's say it's it. not, but when you bet no, no. it. No, that'll do it right there, because what, what could happen here, since um, I know a little bit about this, because okay. I went to jail 103 days for handing out jury nullification flyers oh, here in Orange County. Okay, so, but let's go back to this. What, what could happen here is, um, you might have to get a different lawyer is file against the judge for violating their oath of office yeah. and go under go under civil rights in the RICO Act. Because that moves it up to federal court and takes it out of the state court. Well, this is a federal case. This is well, I understand what she's saying, but every time you file something, they'll try to put it down to a lower court where they have more control. Once you get up in federal court, you usually get more things on your side. Or if, are you talking about if they didn't sign their oath of office? Well, they, they must have an oath of office. There isn't any way around that. And, and the Secretary of State will have them. But you see, if you, if, the, uh, if you sue them under civil rights, that's part of that oath of office. And, and if you attack it that way and they violate their oath of office, then the whole trial is going to get thrown out. They're going to do it again. Maybe we can talk. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit. Yes. yes. Um, okay. So the government did a lot of manipulation, and that whole cat's out of the bag has and all that. Very strange. So, but you think it wasn't 
just that it was mainly about drugs, or was it mainly about the, the power of his innovation that he did, or was it about the money? What about the money part? I, um, did he make tons of money on Silk Road, and were they after him because he made money? Well, the well, point being that Bernie Madoff got 150 years, so that would be that, that is non violent. That's know? a non violent so story. That, that's, that's, about that's somewhat analogous. So yeah. I just wondered. Yes. Um, well, you asked uh, what questions. Uh, in the, I think it was about the platform, not the product, in terms of drugs. I don't think it was about drugs. I think it was because he created this platform. This innovative platform. Yes, but that was a threat because it was it created a marketplace outside government control. Now, I think Bitcoin. This is all my personal opinion. Okay. I think um, Bitcoin was definitely a factor, and Chuck Schumer, who was the main impetus behind this case. In fact, the judge was recommended by Chuck Schumer, Preparar, the head of. Uh, Prosecuting attorney was his special counsel for a decade. Chuck Schumer propelled this case, and if, if, I've heard federal agents say, if, if it weren't for his involvement, it never would have happened. He's in the banking committee. Oh. I think that there's um, definitely an issue about Bitcoin. Okay. So um, that's my opinion. Well, that's all I want to be sure. They didn't say it. Yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, it's not about drugs. We saw that from the sentences. Uh -huh. So. Um, and Bitcoin, I think, was threatening. I mean, now it's become much more established. But yeah, Thanks. and of course, they were taxes weren't being collected either. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I apologize. I came in about ten minutes late, but it's, you've already covered this. So if we uh, cover it again, but can you explain your understanding of how the Silk Road site was compromised? I mean, I, I understand a little bit about encryption, and, and obviously, your son and. People were working with him uh, went to, to great lengths to, to uh, uh, keep their communications not anonymous. How, how did the government? Well, they claimed, and don't ask me for any technical explanations, please. I'm right brain totally insane. But they, Christopher Tarbell, ex FBI agent, said under oath how he found the Silk Road server and got in all this information and penetrated to go to the site. Experts around the world said, that's gibberish. That could not have happened. That's impossible. And um, he said, well, I prove it, but darn, I didn't save my work. I didn't click save after I did this, uh, I did all this. And I'm like, what, the dog ate my evidence, right? And I'm like, you're kidding, in the biggest case of your career. So lame. And the judge accepted it. Well, the defense called for an evidentiary hearing to question how it happened and how, and his uh, statement under oath, and she denied it. So the government has their claim of how they found the server. Um, and like I say, there's all these theories you can, of how it happened. It has to do with the captcha, but I can't, don't, don't, um, when, when, <laughs> don't you say, when you say they found the server, did they find the physical server? Did yeah, in Iceland. It it was, now, Iceland, which of course brings up a whole, a lot of people say, well, the government hacked it. And so is that legal? And they say it is. It says that we, we can hack servers. That's a whole other issue that's, um, Potential precedent: Can the United States government hack a foreign server without a warrant? Can they go to another country and hack it? There's the servers. So. And were the Icelandic authorities pulled into this? Um, yeah, I'm sure. Yes, they were. My name was actually charged with. Yeah, he was actually charged with drug trafficking. Uh, well, the charges and sentences were two different things. So there are many more charges, and this is apparently what the government will do, is to pile on tons of charges that are redundant, but it makes it really sound worse than, even worse, to the jury. But then when it comes to sentencing, oh, well, yeah, that's true, that's redundant. We'll fold that in, we'll fold that in, it's fewer. But at sentencing, it was um, uh, drug trafficking, but it's, I, I believe it's conspiracy, God, I should pull it up. Um, Operated a continuing criminal enterprise, and that's the kingpin charge, which, and it requires, this is interesting, um, f that the kingpin, it's proven and named, five individuals that the kingpin managed, supervised, and organized, and they didn't come up with one name, but they were still allowed to pin the pink kingpin charge on him, which has its own life sentence. They didn't even fulfill the statute. Um, so it was the kingpin charge. Uh, which implies that he was controlling everything and, you know, that it wasn't just a freewheeling open website with some rules. And the jury went along with that? Yeah, they, you know, the jury was, yes, they did. The jury 
was very manipulated. This is my opinion that he, they were very manipulated. A lot of it went right past him. And, you know, the judge says, this is, she's very, you know, she's an authority. And they're like, oh, it must be true. They came to their conclusion in three hours, and that included lunch and a break. Mm -hmm. And I had a lawyer say to me, that just shows that they didn't have a clue what was going on. Yeah. And a case that is complex as this. And then they threw in, so those are the two life sentences. Uh, and then they threw in, um, I think it was 20 years for money laundering, conspiracy to money launder. Not that he did money launder, it's just that he was in a conspiracy to launder money by posting a site. A conspiracy to hack into computers, not that he did it, but that people sold software that you could use for doing it on site. And a conspiracy to sell false IDs, not that he did it, again, but that people did it on site. Yeah. Uh, they didn't even prove he was the only person or when it was or anything. But that's what they charged him. Yeah, it, um, it was filed January 12th. It, um, and then the government has it until June 17th to re reply to the appeal that we've uh, lawyers filed, and then um, they have a few weeks to re rebut that reply. And then the judges take it from there, and it can take, it could be next year before they decide. I'm no legal expert, but has there been much discussion about like a like we have, we have the right to trial by jury of our peers or something like that. And I, like I said, I'm not a legal expert, and you said 10 of the jury members are 40, so that, and like, from what it sounds like, they're technologically literate. Like, I would not consider those people my peers at all. No, and I don't think many jury trials are not your peers. And you can't, you can't. Absolutely not his peers. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, and I look, I'm old too. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not trying to be ageist here, but generally speaking, you're a, you're a rare person. Yes. Anyway, a lot of them, well, I don't think they didn't understand. Now, there were some people, older people, who was an older guy, for instance, who understood it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't blame them. It was extremely complex and confusing. They were completely kept from knowing a lot of the facts. You know, I don't blame them. You know, they were. Manipulated. It does shake my faith in jury trials, though. Yeah. Yeah, where is what? What? Uh, how's he doing? He's um he's in um he's in Manhattan at a transitional facility, which is not as good a environment really as a prison because it's kind of a not meant to be very long. But he asked to be kept there because he doesn't have email or internet, because like most prisoners. So he can't communicate with his lawyers easily if he's not in Manhattan where they are, or at least New York area. And so they granted that so his lawyers can visit him. Because he he's working on the appeal. Ross is working on the appeal. He's going through the discovery. You know, because they dumped, they dumped over 7,000 pages on the defense a week, ten, seven to 10 days before trial. They'd had it for a year. And they wait, and, this, and apparently this is part of the course, no big deal, you know, they just take all this evidence and, come, and then, Look for needles and haystacks. It's pretty amazing to me. Um, and this was a particularly big load. And they still managed to get all that Duryeg and stuff. I was the witness, and I mean, that was all in there. And, you know, they worked hard, lawyers and Ross. But he's still working on the appeal. And he's, he's teaching something? Yeah, he, um, well, he's taught a lot of things. He had a yoga class for a while. He had a, he's tutored a lot of people. But he's had several GED classes that have helped people get their high school diploma. They all love Ross. He's a really good teacher, actually. And um, he, there's a hundred letters from people who know Ross personally on our website that they submitted. Hundred people to the judge at sentencing, saying, "Look, give this guy at least the, the minimum of 20 years. You know, let him have." And um, which she must decide. So very, very impressive. Come on. But um, four of them are inmates. Four of them are, are fellow inmates. One who said he's held four of us getting to college you know, a, a correspondence course. It was because of his patience and his generosity of his time, where other people who were, he was, they were trying to work with, you know, it wasn't happening. So he's really tried to make a, a contribution here and be a force for good and keep, stay positive. It's hard. I'm, pretty, I'm proud of him how he's handling it. It's hard. It's hard for me just to go there. 
you know, never mind him being there all the time. I think of them, you know, conferences like this, and I'm like, I love this. We would just love this, you know. I, you know, which I love it too. But you know, it's so we need people. Yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. next year. <laughs> yes. Let me ask something out of curiosity. Um, what is obviously there's a double standard. There is the, the weak things, the people like us, the individuals. With this, oh, the journalist Brown also something. Oh, well, Barrett Brown. Yeah, and mm -hmm. then you've got your son. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they are just treated like normal individuals. And then you get Hillary Clinton, right? Email scandal. Mm -hmm. You get that other general, and there's a double standard. Where is this double standard being actually forcefully put forth in the government? Say, do you do you realize this? You know, do you realize this injustice that you're committing against individuals? Is there somewhere? Is, I mean, maybe I someone know. else can answer it. I don't know of anything. I mean, there's Congress and, and yeah, but Congress, oversight Congress, committees, Congress, and that's what they're supposed to do. But then Congress but, is the same people. I know. Are the establishment, I'm okay. Right? I know. <laughs> there are watchdog groups. I mean, somebody here might have a better idea about that than I do. It's like people get away with so much. It's true. It depends who you are. You know, if you're part of the elite or you're not. And, yeah. and it's almost impossible for a citizen to pursue justice. The costs. They crush, they crush you with that, and it's just, uh, it's just, it's really wrong. I mean, I go to the prison a lot. I've gotten to know the families. I get to know some of the inmates even, and of course Ross does. I see the children clean to their fathers, get a measly hour a week. That's all I get. They're just crying, and, and these are nonviolent people. And I just, it's, it's horrible. And um, they're not, you know, it's not just statistics. These are real people whose lives are being ruined. And they're not violent. I mean, I'm not saying, look, if I, if, let's say Bernie Madoff brought him up. I'd rather he had an ankle brace with a GPS on and he was working to make uh, pay back some of those people. What good is he doing in prison except costing us money? I feel like that about nonviolent um, offenders. They could be, you know, it's not, you know, it's still some punishment limitation, but we're paying a fortune and the, and the prisons are like now 60% nonviolent because of the drug war. And meanwhile, it was brought up in this talk, in this uh, conference, that cybercrime and other countries hacking into the government are getting, you know, they're not focusing on that as much as they have the drug war. And <laughs> that puts us at risk. You know, Russia, North Korea, China hacking into our defense. And meanwhile, oh, let's go get that guy because he's selling drugs or whatever. And it's like, again, I'm not advocating selling drugs, I'm just saying. The drug war hasn't worked for 40 years. It's cost a fortune. I think it's over a trillion. And I don't know, are fewer people using drugs now? <laughs> anyway, it's terrible. And the prisons are crowded, and I feel like a lot of it's, the, the drug war is really about expanding government power and, and, and revenue. And, because um, it hasn't stopped drugs. And um, the, the prison guard union voted against legalizing marijuana. I'm like, oh really? I guess you gotta keep that inventory coming in. So is that human trafficking? If the humans are the product? We're the biggest incarcerator in the world. And more of our citizens in jail than any country. It's shameful. Um, so uh, Facebook and Senate seems uh, pretty clear that it's a you political know, issue for the judge. But um, was the evidence presented to the jury in the sense to make more on uh, like a emotional Depends on uh, with, with drugs. Like, like, was the jury decision based off of it's, it's a drug problem and the actual political? Absolutely. Uh, they wouldn't like. They wouldn't allow Ross's libertarian views to be known. They never talked about that there were actually legal um, products on Silk Road, and that it was up to vendors to decide. They didn't talk about how there were limitations on things that hurt people. Uh, that that agent that um, everybody's saying lied under how he found the server, and he was the head of the criminal investigation. He was a major player. He wasn't even at trial. They kept him away from trials like he was erased. He was hardly mentioned. Of course, then he can't be cross-examined, can he? Um, it was very manipulated, very controlled narrative. Um, a lot of things were... Another thing, just to give you an example, Ross sat right in front of us in trial, and he could turn around, because we were in the front row being family, and he could turn around, smile and stuff. It breaks. Well, they stopped that, because they didn't want the jury to see that he had a loving family. 
that would smile at him and care about him can't turn around See, and say hi to your family. Erased us, erased, you know, his views, and just created this, this image. So that and murder, that, that uncharged stuff, and created this image that they wouldn't feel, that they could feel okay about convicting. It was terribly manipulated, yeah. Are those prosecutors ever going to be held accountable for what they've done? The main prosecutor has left. After the appeal came out, he's like, I'm out of here, I'm going to the private sector. But you have his name, right? Oh, yeah, I have his name. Um, so eventually, and, eventually, eventually, I mean, I know for your son, it's not necessarily the reason that somebody will have to go after him. Well, it's a matter of proof um, that there's some kind of corruption or whatever. And there's a lot of corruption, but it's not been revealed. Yeah. We don't know who's implicated. That's going to be my next question. Is like, have, we, have we looked into like a judge's connections to, I don't like trial lawyers, a lot of them are Democrats and they're extremely for the, uh, like the drug war because it gives them so much business. It's like, have we looked into look in, I just kind of like conspiracy theory stuff, but looking into that corruption of possible corruption of the drugs or prosecuting attorneys, is that what they Yeah, I mean, I've had some people write me this and that. I, have to, I haven't corroborated it. Um, so I don't want to repeat it, particularly about the judge and about different things. Um, I definitely think it's worth looking into. And um, you know, I don't, I'm not really a forensic computer researcher. I don't have those skills, but certainly would welcome the information just to check it out. Yeah, nice. Anybody knows anybody? Yeah, it's one of those things. I feel like if we get enough awareness, if you probably talk to it, not probably. Yeah, well, it scared me. I, mean, that's the thing. I was, I, I'm not, I wasn't a big government fan or anything before this, but had seeing it up close and personal, it is shocking, frightening, and the more that comes out about government expansion and trampling on the Constitution, it's very frightening. Well, they're weakening it if they, if, with precedent. You know, now there's a precedent that they can use digital evidence to put someone in prison for life. Not hard to get that digital evidence. For one example, they can use a general warrant to search your laptop based on the president here unless it's open. You know, You're not protected by the Fourth Amendment. The, the piece that I read that was most of that about uh, Ross's case was a piece of Wired magazine. Um, the two, two part part? Yeah, yeah. Well, I wrote a, a response to that called Holly Wired. It's a First of all, that he dramatized the agent, how he found the server, as if that was how he, it actually happened. Oh yeah, he's like, he's brilliant, he's, you know, I'm like, okay. Um, a lot of stuff in there was fiction, um, but as someone said, well, he's, he's working on a movie treatment. I mean, that's what it was, it was a movie treatment. But in my blog, I have a whole thing about it. He, he, one of his main sources was Carl Forrest, the corrupt agent, you know, so. Pretty shallow. I know it got a lot of um, exposure. Pretty upsetting. And in fact, Ross, uh, I don't even think I don't know if he even read it. I, I think he said a friend, uh, one of the inmates, threw it away as a sign of solidarity. I'm throwing away my wire. <laughs> and they had these these illustrations of Ross being like this monster over a laptop. I mean, it's just the media. <laughs> you know, except for the media that gets it, gets the big picture, what's important. It's really, um, you know. It, it, I think destructive in many ways, not just with Ross's case. I read between the lines of that. Oh, good you know, for you. Pieces, which is why we're here, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I wonder if yeah. you said that. So what's this documentary? Oh, well, the documentary is Deep Web, and it's um, by Alex Winter. It's on Netflix and other things. And it's not just about Ross, but he's featured pretty strongly. I'm in it, 50 feet wide, my face. I'm like, no. <laughs> but anyway, um, and um, it's good. Um, I had some quibbles, but generally, I think it really brings up questions that um, need to be asked. It's brought us a lot of support, and but it only goes up to the trial. And of course, after the trial, the corruption came out. It's mentioned just in a sentence update, and the sentencing. None of that's in it. 
but you get up, and it's also about the deep web in general, not just Ross, and about how, you know, sort of all about it. It's, it's really good. It's, it's it, you know, it's pretty riveting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, your son was charged with procuring murder. Um, no, he wasn't. He was not charged. He was not charged. No, that's what I was saying. Not a trial. It was. Uh, it, it was charged, but it was dropped before it went to trial. No, no. Well, yeah, there was an allegation that they never charged him with. Now there is an indictment in Maryland. It's two years old. No, it's more than two years old. That um, Carl Force, the corrupt agent, was part of the allegation in that indictment. It's from Maryland, and it's still sitting there. They haven't brought it to trial, and um, it's supposed to. Indictments are supposed to, you know, right to a speedy trial. They're not supposed to sit there for years. There it is. And it's, you know, indictments can be based on hearsay. So that's not the same standard as a trial and being charged and convicted for it. He was never, it wasn't part of the charges. <coughs> yeah, I, I had a, maybe it came in later, but I had a quote where the, the, um, the uh, prosecutor said, just before I start talking about this for like the next few hours, he was never charged with it, and there were no murders. But, and then went on, and all I had was chats from Carl Force, the corrupt agent, and other uh, chats that supposedly, um, you know, they said DPR, so they lost the DPR, so, you know. did, did your attorney object to that? Yes, absolutely. And actually uh, called for a mistrial, and now in the appeal, like the federal judge, the former federal judge, she, a big part of the amicus brief is what she brought to the table, which was the tale of the murder for hire, it's uncharged, is wagging the head of the sentencing. And this is wrong. He wasn't charged, he wasn't convicted, but of course the media, you'd never know that, so I understand why you think it. It's much more sensationalistic to say that. So anyway, I, I guess I better wrap it up. But thanks for coming and, and, and listening. I really appreciate it. And go to our website. I have a whole lot more um, on the case, and Ross himself. And we're about to put up a home video uh, that shows him. And you'll get a sense of who he is. He's, he's not scary. He's not dangerous. He, he should be out. So thank you so much.